This is the Whisper Corner, and this is New Junior Histories. My dad has been recently cleaning out some sheds in the bottom of the garden, and there was loads of books from whenever we were young. And he asked if I wanted anything, and this book looked familiar. It's a book that I honestly probably last opened during primary school. So in the top here we have the Normans, and the bottom we have, you know, I guess, considering it's trench warfare. World War One. New Junior Histories Book Four. It's quite the old book smell. Um, I've recently lost my voice, so I will go between. Um, Soft spoken, whispered, and probably at some point nothing, not through any sort of planning of my own. So we have our, our island story 55 BC, 55 BC to AD 410, everyday life in Roman Britain, our island story from 410 to 1066. So how much space are they going to give 650 pages? Sorry, 650 years. Three pages. Lovely. I'll fit a lot in there. Everyday life in Anglo-Saxon Britain. Our island story, 1066 to 1485. Life in a Roman Life in a Norman castle. Everyday life in medieval England. Life in a medieval monastery. English wool and English cloth in medieval England. Our island story, 1485 to 1714. Everyday life in Tudor England. William Shakespeare and the Elizabethan Theatre. So four pages on Shakespeare, three pages on 400 years of history, okay? Our island story, 1714 to 1901. Everyday life in 18th century England. Industrial England in the 18th and 19th centuries. Everyday life in Victorian England, 1837 to 1901. Our island story, 1901 to the present day, and then changing Britain, new things for old. So let's see. Thousands of years ago, our island of Britain looked very different from how it looks today. Most of the low-lying country was covered by trees, bushes or scrub and the lowland not covered in this way was usually lake or marsh. Many kinds of birds made their homes in the trees and marshes, animals such as wild boars, deer, elks and oxen lived in the forests, and wolves and bears prowled about on the hills. The ancient Britons who inhabited Britain at that time lived in caves or in holes on slopes, hunted and fished, made weapons from flint and bone, and clothed themselves with animal skins. Adventurous men from countries round the Mediterranean Sea, wandering about Europe with their families, eventually reached Britain, crossing the sea in frail boats or coracles. We call these men Iberians. They were small and dark-haired. They knew how to grow corn, 
how to grind it into flour, and how to keep cattle, sheep and goats. They made little houses, shaped like round beehives, burnt down trees to clear spaces in the forests, and sowed the seeds on the land that they had cleared. Sometimes they piled walls of earth around their settlements. They erected big stones, which we call dolmens, and buried their dead beneath mounds of earth. We call these burial places barrows. Other tribes from Europe followed the Iberians to Britain. Some came in search of metals, which travellers told them could be found in abundance in Britain. This was true, for tin and copper could be found in Cornwall, sorry, could be mined in Cornwall, and gold in Wales and Ireland. The smiths of those times had learnt how to extract metal from rock, and by mixing tin and copper they made a useful metal called bronze. The people of one tribe, which came from Europe, were very different in appearance from the small, dark-haired Iberians, for they were tall and fair-haired. These folk had bows and arrows, and axes made of stone and bronze. Drinking vessels shaped like beakers have been dug up from places where these fair-haired people lived, and so these people came to be known as the beaker folk. They worshipped the sun and sacrificed animals and human beings to it. They put up circles of large stones for their religious ceremonies, and one famous circle of stones called Stonehenge can still be seen on Salisbury Plain. The fair-haired Baker folk and dark-haired Iberians married each other and had children, some of whom were dark, some fair, and some a mixture of dark and fair. Just as the earliest men in Britain are called people of the Stone Age, because their tools and weapons were chiefly made of stone, so the later inhabitants became known as people of the Bronze Age, because their tools and weapons were made of bronze. The people of the Bronze Age also made helmets and ornaments, gold rings and bracelets. Some of them traded in Gaul, or with Eastern merchants who knew Britain as the Tin Islands. And here we have Stonehenge as it appears today. And then some people called Celts came to Britain from the continent of Europe, at first in small bands, but later in larger groups when a number of families travelled together. There were different tribes of Celts, Gaels or Goidals, the Cymri and the Brythons. Our names of Britons and Britain came, sorry, come from the name of the Celtic tribe known as the Brythons. Other tribes were the Belgae, the Silures and the Catuvalani. The Celts were tall and strong with fair or reddish hair and blue eyes. They had iron weapons, which, being better than bronze weapons, enabled the Celts to drive the men of the Bronze Age to the west and into the hills. The Celts made wheeled chariots and strong ploughs. Since these people used iron to make tools and weapons, we call them people of the Iron Age. The Celts knew how to weave cloth, how to dye it with bright colours, and how to make tartan patterns. They wore trousers or breeches, and coloured shirts and cloaks. They were proud of their appearance, and many wore long moustaches. They were fierce and courageous in battle. When they died, their belongings were buried with them. 
weapons, helmets, shields, bracelets, brooches and cups. The Celts knew how to make forts with earthen ramparts and protective dishes. They chose the best warriors to be their chiefs, and the tribes often quarrelled and fought against each other. Sometimes the Celts crossed the English Channel and landed in Gaul to help the Gauls against their Roman conquerors. These were the people who lived in southern Britain when Julius Caesar the Roman general decided to make an expedition from Gaul to Britain in the year 55 BC. And this bronze mirror has a beautiful Celtic design engraved on the back. So, our island story. 55 BC to 410 AD. I'll read this. In the year 55 BC, Julius Caesar, the famous Roman general, having conquered Gaul, now known as France, decided to make an expedition to Britain. He tells the story of this expedition in his written account of his war adventures, for Julius Caesar was a writer as well as a soldier. He describes how he first sent a spy with some soldiers in a ship to find out about harbours and landing places in Britain. To obtain further information, Julius Caesar also questioned the traitors who had visited Britain. When Caesar's spy returned after five days, Caesar set off with about 80 ships which carried two legions of soldiers. Eighteen ships carrying his cavalry were preparing to follow. The Britons, waiting on the shore as Caesar and his men approached, threw spears and other missiles at the Romans, as, hampered by the weight of their armour, they struggled through the surf. While some of the Romans were hesitating, the standard bearer of one of the legions jumped into the water and called to the soldiers to follow him to protect the standard of the eagle which he carried. In spite of the stout resistance that the Britons made, the Romans landed, but Caesar soon found that he had not enough men. He was very impressed with the skill of the British charioteers. Caesar returned to Gaul, but he invaded Britain again in the following year, 54 BC. This time Caesar had more than 800 ships, five legions of soldiers and 2,000 cavalry men. When the Britons saw these big forces approaching the shore, they did not dare to fight on the beach, but retired a little way inland and waited. Cassifolanus, chief of a British tribe called the Catalovini, Catavulloni, was the commander-in-chief of the British forces. After losing one battle, Cassifolanus decided to avoid further battles with the powerful Roman army and instead he determined to harry the Romans while they were on the march. The Trinovantes and several other tribes submitted to Caesar and gave him information which enabled him to attack and defeat Cassivellaunus. Although Caesar subdued part of Britain, he did not stay long but returned with his army to Gaul. No more Roman soldiers came to Britain until nearly a hundred years later. And then, in 43 AD, the Emperor Claudius sent a Roman army, led by a general called Aulus Claudius. Claudius came to Britain for a short time. He defeated Cunbolinus, chief of the Catalvani, and later Aulus Plotius captured a British chief called Caraticus and sent him to Rome. The Romans did not conquer Britain easily. While
where they were attacking and destroying British priests called Druids in the Isle of Anglesey. Boudicca, the Queen of the Iceni, led an attack on the Roman towns of Colchester and St Albans. Boudicca's men killed thousands of Romans and burnt many buildings. The Romans had their revenge in another battle in which Boudicca realizing that she was defeated, poisoned herself. The Romans settled in Britain and stayed there for nearly 400 years. They made roads and built forts, fortified walls and towns. They built a big fort at York, one at Chester, one at Kirlon, and many others. A Roman governor called Agricola marched soldiers into Scotland and built some forts between, Firth of, between the Firth of Forth and the Firth of Clyde. The Emperor Hadrian in the year 126 AD built the wall known as Hadrian's Wall, which is some 74 miles long, stretching from the mouth of the River Tyne on the northeast coast to the end of the Solway Firth on the northwest coast. It was constructed to keep in check the warlike Picts and Scots. There was peace in Britain where the Romans ruled, but towards the end of their stay, the Angles and Saxons began to raid, coming across the North Sea in their open boats. The Romans built forts and signal stations along the east and south coasts to keep the Anglo-Saxon raiders in check. When the Romans returned to Rome about the year 410 AD to protect that city from enemies who were attacking it, the Anglo-Saxon raiders found it easy to land in Britain. People to remember Julius Caesar, a Roman general, Cassivellaunus, a British chief, Claudius, Emperor of Rome, Gunbolinus, a British chief, also known as Gunbolin, Caractacus, Caractacus, a British chief, also known as Cardac, Aulus Plotius, a Roman general, Bodicea, a British queen, Agricola, a Roman governor, and Hadrian, Emperor of Rome. Let me know if you want me to continue. Oops, it is easy. No, it's easy. Well, I'm not going to read too much more of that page. Young Kevin decided to cut that out. So, as I was saying, Thanks for watching.